Let's start off with our true or false. It's time for true or false on Be Green with Amy Live. Answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below, and Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Okay, so our first true or false question is true or false. If you take the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy and multiply it by 100, that's about how many microorganisms are in your colon. Okay, guys, type it in, true or false, and we're going to ask Dr. Miller what she thinks. Okay, Dr. Miller, what do you think? Okay, to be honest, Amy, I didn't know. <laughs> but I, you helped me ahead of time, so this is a true, this is true. So for people who don't know, I didn't know how many stars there were in our galaxy, but I do know how many microbiome. It's estimated, there we go, we had an answer. True. Um, there is estimated to be around 39 trillion microbiome in our colon. So, and there are other things besides bacteria, but they're kind of a mix of everything, but that is where we are right now. Wow. I, I don't even know how they count the stars or, <laughs> or the microorganisms. That just blows me away. That's a big number guys. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how they do it. That's just it's so amazing. Yeah, that's a lot, a lot of microorganisms. And, and just thinking about what's on your body, you have them in your eyelashes and just in all different places. In your ears, your, yeah, everywhere. Yeah. So it's really, it, I mean, people are starting to learn more about it, but it really is important to, to know about this because there's that many and it definitely does have an effect on our, our health and, and what we do. So I wanted to start by talking about gut health. Why do you think gut health is important? It's the gut health, gut health is important because it is related to everything in our body. It's connected with everything. It's about getting nutrients in. So we intake food and have to digest it and get nutrients in. It's about how well we have digest and absorb those nutrients. So whether we have energy, whether we have the vitamins and minerals we need, um, it has to do with that. It's how well we eliminate toxins. Uh, so anything that we take into our body, both external toxins and toxins that our body makes, so metabolic toxins, that has to be excreted. Things like excess cholesterol, excess hormones, these are waste products that we have to excrete. So our excretion is really important. So how well that's working and detoxification. So we know we live in a toxic world. There's chemicals everywhere from non-organic food with pesticides to GMOs to uh, air, you know, everything. There's so many toxins or virus or bacteria that might be on food. All of this has to be detoxified and that's done in our gut. And more than that though, we know so much more that the gut in, and this is via the microbiome oftentimes, is communicating with our whole body. It's communicating with our mind. So it's leading to mental health issues. It's communicating with our um, blood vessels. It's contributing to cardiovascular disease, directly talks with our immune system, which I know a lot about. So if our gut is out of balance, our immune system is out of balance. So if anyone has inflammation or autoimmunity or joint pains, it's the gut. If people have headaches, it's the gut. So it all goes back to that skin disorders, um, acne. I'm going to go right away to someone's gut health. So it's so important for health and it's important that we get it healthy. Yeah. And you just wouldn't think that it was all that that was all responsible for it. And I guess you see with the plant based telehealth, you see a lot of patients that are having these different issues and you're able to, to help them tweak their diet and lifestyle in order to to help them with these different issues. So what 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 damages our gut? in our microbiome? That's a fabulous question. So if you think about what the gut is made up of, um, you know, it, it starts in the mouth. And so it's got this gentle mucous membrane covering it and saliva is there with digestive enzymes. And it goes into our esophagus and it's just has, it's one cell layer thick, the uh, endothelium, that lining of our gut. So it's it's into our endothelium, one cell lining thick in our stomach. Again, one cell lining thick that secretes all this acid and digestive enzymes to break up our food into the small intestine, which secretes all the digestive enzymes. Again, one cell layer thick. And then large intestine, 
with the microbiome and that's where we're absorbing water and we're absorbing more nutrients and we're um, forming stool to get rid of it. We're working on excretion and detoxification down there and we're getting rid of our waste. So that is what makes it up. So, and it needs the vagus nerve to control it. The vagus nerve is coming from our brain and 20% of its fibers go to the digestive tract. So that's the large and small intestine. That's the stomach. That's the um, liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it's telling you to secrete digestive enzymes. So if you were to look at a green apple, yum, I love green apples are kind of tart, right? I might start salivating. And that is my vagus nerve saying, oh, there's food. It's getting ready. Get the digestive enzymes ready. Um, so that's the first phase of digestion has already happened. You just, when I'm looking at that apple and, um, so that's part of the function of the vagus nerve. It keeps food moving through to keep our bowels regular so we're not constipated. It um, helps us know when to digest it. But 80% of the vagus nerves are coming back to our brain from the gut, telling us, whoa, we're full or keep, you know, this is what's going on. I need nutrients. We're hungry down here. We're full down here, telling us our blood glucose, like, you know, enough, we've had enough protein, we've had enough glucose, they're monitoring all of that for us. So we're in communication. So when you ask what goes wrong, anything that disturbs any of those levels is what goes wrong. And so I'm going to start with the vagus nerve because I just talked about it. People always start with food, but I'm going to start with the vagus nerve. And that is so crucial to good gut health. So when you, vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system right? And the parasympathetic nervous system is uh, rest and repair, relax and digest. These are some of the nicknames for it. And so if you have uh, not enough parasympathetic, if you're stressed out, you get sympathetic, which is fight or flight, run, you know, stress. So if you're living stressed out all day long, you're going to be in, you're going to be breathing kind of faster, a little more shallow. And what happens in sympathetic uh, when you're stressed out is your gut shuts down, your parasympathetic shuts down. That's what shuts down. So you don't have parasympathetic stimulation. So if you were to eat in a stressful environment, you that food is not going to get digested as well in the stomach. And then it's not going to get absorbed as well in the in the um, in the small and large intestine, the microbiome gets discombobulated. There was actually a study, and the authors wrote the microbiome gets discombobulated in stress. That was their word. And so what happens is the microbiome is supposed to function to help digest the food, to detoxify the food. It's con it's communicating with the immune system what's going on in the body. And when we're stressed out, that's not happening in orderly fashion. So now the food that you just ate is in your gut, it's not digesting appropriately, it's not It's not talking appropriately with the microbiome and the, and the rest of the immune system. And it's actually can cause inflammation locally just because you're eating when you're stressed. It's not that you're not gonna fully digest it, so you're not gonna be able to get the nutrients out of it. So if you're eating this delicious bowl of berries, let's say with all these antioxidants and good loving nutrients, and you think, oh my gosh, I'm so healthy because I'm eating this food but you're so stressed out and you're stress eating it right now. Well, you're not going to get those nutrients out of it. You're not going to get the maximum amount of nutrition out of it. So we see that for people, they're stress eating and that alone can cause heartburn. We know that there's, we call them stress ulcers for a reason, heartburn, reflux, the pain that people get when they're eating, this is stress ulcers. And this is a result of the vagus nerve not getting a chance to do its job and increasing in stomach acid being produced because we're stressed out. And so uh, stress is such a big thing that we have to work on. And when we're not stressed and we get parasympathetic nervous system stimulation, it all works so smoothly and we get better digestion, better absorption of nutrients, better excretion of waste. And sometimes that alone is causing our stomach issues. And I think we all know a little bit about this. If we've ever been stressed, like if if a car is about to turn right in front of me and I slam on my brakes, I feel it in my stomach. Like my, my adrenaline kicks in and I immediately feel like kind of sick in my stomach. Like, whoa, that was terrible. Or if we're going to go give a big talk and we get really nervous, we might feel it in our gut. A little bit of nausea, a little bit of loose stool before you go do something you're really nervous for. This is sympathetic nervous system shutting down our guts. If you eat right at that moment, it's very damaging to our system. And that's one thing alone when people live in a stressful environment, it's one 
significant contributor. It's not the cause, but it's a significant contributor to gut issues. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to talk about because it's so prevalent. And the second thing that is, is a poor diet. So uh, our microbiome feeds on fiber and the microbiome protects that integrity of the gut lining. So the whole operation of whether we're able to absorb our nutrients and digest our food appropriately and get rid of toxins and talk to the microbiome and the, the immune system, that whole function depends on whether we're eating fiber. And if we're not eating enough fiber, if we eat a standard American diet, which um, is known to be extremely deficient in fiber, those microbiome that are supposed to be fed and protect us and keep our guts healthy, prevent these chronic illness, it breaks down. The whole system breaks down. And we see all sorts of illnesses from autoimmune diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, hypothyroidism, to high blood pressure, high cholesterol, acne, headache, chronic headaches. I mean, you name it, we're seeing it because of this, this lack of appropriate fiber. That's one thing. Another thing is antibiotics. We know this, they destroy the microbiome, right? So many of us took antibiotics when we were younger, before we knew this information, not our fault, but it happened. And so it, it threw it out of balance and now it's out of balance and that's gonna damage, that's gonna lead to di further digestive issues and, and issues throughout our bodies. Um, things like NSAIDs, ibuprofen, and that one's not as known, but it's very damaging to the microbiome and the gut lining, actually. And so the gut lining can become disrupted just because of taking chronic ibuprofen use or NSAID use, any of those NSAIDs, um, those anti-inflammatory medications that we take. So that's disruptive. Uh, environment, toxins in the environment are disruptive. Not exercising is disruptive. I think you have a true and false question about what, what I'm about to say next, and that is the sleep disrupted. Is that okay? Let's let's see, guys. We're gonna put out there. You a true or false about sleep? True or false? An unhealthy microbiome can interfere with your sleep. I know that I've heard about the circadian rhythm and lights interfering, but let's see what you guys say. And then, Dr. Miller, why don't you tell us about that? Right. And the answer is absolutely both reflect both. So sleep has been shown to interfere with your microbiome. If you sleep less than six hours for three nights in a row, your microbiome is significantly out of balance. We call it dysbiosis, which can lead to some of these uh, GI issues, the gut issues, or systemic issues such as headaches or your autoimmune disease. Those of us with autoimmune disease, we know my joints are stiff if I don't sleep well. And now I know why my microbiome is out of balance. Uh, my gut is out of balance just because a lack of sleep that alone is enough to do it. So, and the opposite happens too. If you don't sleep, that's, I mean, if your microbiome is out of balance, you don't sleep. So both of those. So if you eat a lot of sugar and junk food or animal products, you may not sleep very well. And it's one of the reasons, Amy, you probably know this because you counsel and work with so many people. When people go plant-based, they report better sleep, yeah. right? Yes, absolutely. It's so common. People always say, oh, it's great. I'm sleeping better. Why are they sleeping better? Well, their microbiome is in better balance. So you sleep better. I mean, it's so interesting to me. So those are some of the reasons why the gut can get damaged over time. Yeah, I, sometimes I think about gardening and how I don't have a green thumb, so I've killed many a plant. And I think about how if they don't get the right nutrients or if they don't get enough water or if they don't get enough sunshine, they'll get diseases or they'll attract pests. And I, I kind of think of that like, like what you were describing with the gut, that if it's not in balance, nature is going to do its thing. It's not always pretty. <laughs> Beautiful analogy. Yeah. And while you're out there gardening, Amy, you're breathing in the sense of nature and the dirt and you're, you're getting some of that microbiome into you. And there are studies that show that that's beneficial. So good things all around. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. We definitely meant to be outdoors more. And, and I think studies are showing that we probably <clears throat> spend most of our time indoors. Yeah. And, and that can be pretty mm -hmm. disruptive too. So, I wanted to talk about, because you kind of touched upon, upon the, the moods. I think I had another question for everybody there, if I can uh, find it. Let's see. Yes. True or false, guys? 
the microbiome is home to around 90 to 95 percent of your happy neurotransmitter serotonin. Mm, that's a tricky one. Okay, guys, you typed in your answer. Dr. Miller, what do you say? It's true. It's crazy. So I think people are starting to know this now. But uh, when I was in medical school 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, we did not know this. So we thought serotonin has a lot to do with your mood. It's your happiness. It's known as your happiness hormone. And so uh, if people's serotonin was low or even out of balance, even slightly, they could have things like depression, anxiety, mental health. And so we would give people uh, medications uh, called SSRI, serotonin, select serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So what they do is they inhibit serotonin from being taken back up. So it, it basically it increases your serotonin level. And we thought it was all in the brain. And now we know it's in the gut. And so there's a strong link with gut health and the microbiome and mental health, anxiety, depression, these things. Um, there's a study that reports people who eat more than seven to eight servings of vegetables and fruit, which I don't even think that's very many, but people who eat more than seven to eight servings had signif reported significantly less depression and anxiety. That alone, the colorful fruits and vegetables, the green leafy vegetables, the antioxidants, for, I mean, the um, the omega-3 fatty acids from flax and chia seeds and green leafy vegetables and walnuts, that all of those things, there's studies that show that they improve mental health. And the last one that we always have to talk about is fiber. Fiber alone improves mental health because it's improving that microbiome. When you get the microbiome back in balance by feeding it the right good stuff, then it repairs that uh, the integrity of the of the of the membrane the in that inner membrane that's one cell layer thick it gets repaired and when it's repaired now you no longer have little um, toxins or bacteria or or um, food particles of going through it like they're not supposed to the immune system quiets down and the vagus is talking with the brain remember i said 80 percent of the vagus nerve is going up to the brain and that is is has a lot to do with your mood and when you have feed it that fiber and the gut is getting healthy it's making serotonin and that serotonin is going up the vagus nerve to the brain or it's traveling to the brain through the bloodstream and it is talking with our brain and our mood improves so if people are suffering from a lot of depression anxiety make sure you're getting plenty of fibers make sure you eat plenty of leafy green vegetables fresh fruits and vegetables colorful and omega-3s from flax and chia and flax seeds, I mean, and hemp seeds, that is a start, a good start to improving mental health and along with exercise and sleep and all the lifestyle factors. Right. And you are a lifestyle mm -hmm. medical doctor. So you, even though we're talking about the mi microbiome, you have covered all of these different pillars that, that we're kind of touching upon in, in more detail and how it, we are talking about how important gut health is, but you need the other things to help as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that some, some people, especially if they're not familiar with the plant-based lifestyle, they'll think, okay, fiber. So I'll just take this Metamucil and I'm good to go. So can you tell us why that's not the real solution? Yes. Yeah, so fiber is found in all plant foods. So, and that includes everything from fruits and vegetables, of course, to all your whole grains that are growing very high in fiber legumes all the beans are high in fiber nuts and seeds are high in fiber so eating any of those foods and it's best to do a mix and we know this from some of our our gi doctors who you've had on your show who are telling us that if you eat more than 35 different types of fruit, uh, fiber uh, so fruits and vegetables and whole grains and beans uh, plants basically greater than 35 plants a week that you're getting enough diversity you want to feed the different microbiome they they each eat different types of fiber interestingly um, and then there's polyphenols which are found in berries and that purple and deep purple and blue color and found in green tea and dark chocolate so eating a mix of all these foods is going to feed that microbiome and get a diverse microbiome which is going to improve our health so um, yeah so that's so important to us and um, I actually, I want to, can I touch on something? Yeah, go ahead. There's something I wanted to talk about, and that was the gut issues that I see commonly are um, irritable bowel syndrome. So that is a functional disorder where there's nothing wrong when people get scoped, either an upper scope or a colonoscopy, or they get a CAT scan, they get blood work, all that is normal, but people have 
they may have diarrhea, they may have constipation, it may alternate, they may have gas and bloating, and they're just not comfortable. Got, their digestion is just off, and they can tell it's off. So that's IBS. We see a lot of GERD, which is heartburn. I see a lot of celiac disease, which is a genetic thing. It's a predisposition where people react to gluten in their diet, and then they get um, it starts with gut issues, but they can have joint pains. They can have all sorts of systemic things, fatigue, fevers, um, rashes, things like that. Uh, then there's inflammatory bowel disease. This is autoimmune also. And these are becoming more common, unfortunately. And these are things like ulcerative colitis, uh, Crohn's disease, micros microscopic colitis, which, which is a collagen de de deposition disease. We're seeing more of those. Uh, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth, and that's a dysbiosis. The bacteria are out of balance, and so they're migrating up higher, and we're getting lots of gas and bloating and, and irregular stools from that. Constipation, leaky gut, which is that uh, loss of integrity of the, of the wall, of intestinal wall that I was talking about. It's extremely common, and that's the one that leads to all these systemic um, disorders that we're seeing from headaches and high cholesterol, autoimmune diseases and joint pains and rashes and things like that. And then hemorrhoids. And all of this is related to gut health, right? So when we talk about big picture of gut health, that is what we're thinking of. And I actually have a few things I want to point out as tips to improve gut health. So oh, we love tips. Yeah. So okay, I, I, think I, there's, ready. I think I have 13 of them here. And so I'm going to point out 13 of my top tips that I work on. And we may work on one more than other and others. And, you know, when I say what, what types of things can go wrong, whether it's your digestion, your absorption, your elimination, your detoxification, your nervous system, your vagus, any of these can go wrong. And we can do blood testing to look at this. Um, so there's certain things in your blood, like an H. pylori, a certain bacteria, which might be in blood. We can do stool testing to look at if you're actually absorbing your protein, your, your fat. Some people aren't absorbing well, or they need digestive enzymes. Some people are, um, um, not have abnormal bacteria and we can detect that and help them get it back in balance. So there's a lot we can do through, we test people. Um, but in addition to that, so my tips are after we, if you have any of these disorders, or if you have irregular gut and you're facing any systemic issue, these are some things that I tell my patients and I wanted to share with everyone that I think okay. are super important. So tips to improve overall gut health. Number one is so important and it's so overrated and so simple. You guys are going to want to hit me when you hear how easy this is. Chew your food well. That's the number one thing with digestion. I can't tell you how many patients have said to me, Dr. Miller, my digestion's out of balance. When I eat corn, <clears throat> I see corn in my stool. And I think that's not your digestion that's out of balance. It has to be mechanically broken down in your mouth. That means you're eating too fast. <clears throat> you're not chewing it completely and swallowing it. So number one is chew because what happens when that undigested corn, let's say, in your gut, it actually is your stomach, your your intestines don't know what to do with that. What They need it to be mechanically broken down so that they can further break it down and get the absorb the nutrients. But when it's a big chunk of corn, they can't do anything about it. It gets into your gut. It starts fermenting. The bacteria start working on it and ferments. It can cause gas. It can cause bloating. It can cause heartburn. It can cause irregular stools, maybe looser stools than you're supposed to have. And this is all because it's not chewed. So that's number one. Number two is you're not getting all the nutrients from it, right? There's so many nutrients. We know people know this if they eat cruciferous vegetables like cabbage and kale and broccoli, bok choy, some of the healthiest foods in the world. But you have to activate it because the enzyme is in a cell and the um, it's activated when you chew it and they come together to activate it. And so that only happens when you chew your food. So I can't say enough about the importance of chewing your food. So that's number one. If anyone has any gut health, chew your food maybe 30 times. I, I, I'm a fast eater and I have I have health issues. So uh, now I'm working hard on when I take a bite of something, I set my fork down in between bites and I chew it. And then I pick up my fork, eat my next bite. So I'm not just shoveling in like I used to. I'm eating one bite at a time and, and it does make a difference. So that's number one. And number two is related, and it's eat slowly and mindfully. When you eat it fast, you're, you tend to shovel it in. You're not going to chew well. So eating slowly, being aware of your food. Often when you have a moment of gratitude for this beautiful dish, how lucky we are to have food because some people in this world don't have it, that moment helps us 
helps us go more parasympathetic. It helps start to get the vagus nerve in order. It slows down with all the stresses that we're dealing with from the day just by having a moment to focus on our food. So um, that's number two. I think that's a great tip. I think that there are a lot of people that eat standing up in their kitchen. Sometimes, I don't know why, but they eat over the sink. And I bet when people are hearing this, they're like, how does she know? I, I just, I've heard this happen so much. And I think, how can you possibly go and take these recommendations that you're giving? And if you're standing up and eating, I mean, just the fact that you're standing up is that's saying something about your, where your mindset right. is. So sit right. down. <laughs> be comfortable, take a moment to reset yourself and then eat and then that'll help you chew better too so now you're covering one and two all in one and those are really important i made those top one and two on my list so uh the third thing i've already touched on it and that's eating more fiber eating fiber is essential to good gut health that's all there is to it and you can hear this from all those gi experts that are talking and they're done an amazing job spreading the word about the importance of fiber. And it's true. Uh, fiber food is in all plants. So it's in fruits, it's in vegetables, it's in your whole grains, it's in you know bowl of oatmeal, it's in your bowl of quinoa, it's in legumes, it's in nuts and seeds. So eat those foods. It's not in animal products. It's not in processed foods. So your diet, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, which we're hoping you are, or at least predominantly, then uh, you're getting a lot of fiber and that's super important to gut health. Uh, number four is eat more dark leafy green vegetables. So especially raw. And what I have found in my patients, even the ones who are on these beautiful whole food plant-based diets and they know what they're doing, they're eating good, good meals, they're not eating enough dark leafy greens that are raw. And here's why it's important. So the, the, uh, the lettuces, the leafy greens have their own microbiome on it. It's been shown that when you eat the raw greens, that they communicate with our microbiome, they improve the good microbiome and they help the nervous system quiet down. So people with, um, with autoimmunity, with, with inflammation, anyone facing inflammation right now, eating the dark leafy greens actually communicates directly with the immune system, quiets things down. And there's a study that shows it's the greens that is doing that. And it's probably because of the microbiome, in addition to all the phytonutrients and antioxidants and wonderful vitamins and minerals in this leafy green, that's what we always thought, that it was just the leafy greens, that they're so good for us and they heal us. And now we know that the microbiome on them is actually talking with our microbiome and improving us. So I say, if you're not eating a salad a day, eat a big salad or two medium salads, or maybe a small green smoothie that's mostly greens, not too much fruit, um, or eat some broccoli and bean dip, or find a way to get these raw greens in you, you know, mix it in with the rest of your diet, because they do make a difference to gut health and overall health as well. Yeah, I eat a big salad every day, and I prepare it ahead of time. So I have a few for the week. Mm -hmm. And I really try to take a lot of leafy greens and I chop them up very finely so that this way I fit more in the bowl and that my jaw isn't too sore from chewing. Right. <laughs> and then it makes it easier because then you can break it down and chew it without it having to take mm -hmm. you an hour to get through it and you get more. Absolutely. Those are great tips, Amy. And, and it's, she's what she just pointed out is she's pre chewing it. I like to say, cause by chopping yeah. it up, you're doing the work for you by the knife. So that's great. Uh, and that's a, that's a great tip. Uh, the fifth one is to avoid dairy products at all costs. Dairy products are the number one damaging food to the gut line. So I have a lot of patients that are whole food plant-based, but they'll go out to dinner with family or something and they'll splurge and they'll get a little dairy in. And the next day they message me through our portal and they're like, oh my God, Dr. Miller, I feel miserable. And I'm like, well, what did you eat? Uh oh, you know, we can fix it. What did you eat? And there's almost always dairy involved. Mm -hmm. So I would strongly urge you to read labels, avoid it like the plague, because it will bring back symptoms and bring new ones. It, it's been shown to cause direct inflammation in the gut and damage it and you know, if we're facing inflammatory conditions, that's the number one thing that's got to go, even in little amounts. Wow. Um, There's so many plant-based alternatives now. Mm -hmm. that, you know, even, and if you go to a restaurant, maybe you just have to take that something with you, you know. Yeah, that's a great tip. You're such a good counselor. You help with all these tips <laughs> to make it doable. I love it. It's great to 
work with you. So you could tell us how to do it after I explain <laughs> what should be done. Um, yeah, you're right. And there's even like plant-based yogurts and I mean, you can get it all plant-based now. So there's no reason to eat regular dairy. So I hope people aren't. The next one is to avoid or eat minimal animal products. Um, like, oh, did you have a question about that? Oh, let's see if I did. <laughs> you, you, you were going so well that I was just saying, oh, this is great. Okay, let's see. We have, I think that we did. Yes. All right, guys, here's another true or false. True or false, when we eat animal products, they have factors that directly contribute to aging. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, type in your answers, true or false, and Dr. Miller. The answer is true. So they do age us faster. They produce um, things like TMAO. So they release um, chemicals from it that go to our liver and are converted to what's called TMAO. And this was figured out maybe 10 years ago now. Um, and it was published in New England Journal of Medicine. And it was so interesting to know the direct link between meat and <clears throat> some of these symptoms we see. So it releases these toxins. Toxins go to our skin. They age us, our skin faster. And they go to our liver and our whole body. And it contributes to heart disease, chronic kidney disease, which is a very big idea. I mean, a big problem. And um, other disorders. So yes, meat is extremely toxic. And I love that question about aging because I'm, as we all are aging in this world, we're always thinking about that. In addition to be reversing chronic illness to being as healthy as we can and age well. And the last thing we want to do is be eating toxins that are going to change our microbiome and disrupt our gut lining and contribute to our overall toxic load in our body. And our goal is to be lower toxic load. That's how we age better. And so I love that question. That was very well put. Um, my next point, I think we're at seven, is to avoid processed foods and food additives. And this is really important. And it's hard these days because in the plant-based world, there's a lot of plant-based processed foods. And, you know, when I first went plant-based, there it wasn't there. I had to eat brown rice. I had to eat sweet potatoes. I had to eat vegetables and fresh fruit. But now I can eat rice. I can eat rice cakes or I can eat crackers or I can eat other processed foods, right? And that is not good for our guts. The, the chemicals, the additives in it, that disrupts the microbiome directly and it disrupts the gut integrity. So it contributes to leaky gut. It contributes to inflammation. People with autoimmune or systemic inflammation, processed foods will ruin everything they've done. And I've seen that in my own lupus when I was feeling great and then I ate some processed crackers I felt terrible the next day. And that was the processing of the food. And if I eat brown rice, I feel fine. But if I eat rice crackers, I didn't feel fine. It's overly processed foods. And so you want to read labels. You want to be real careful. Really try to minimize those foods. And if it has chemicals that you don't recognize as you're reading it, like sodium, lauryl sulfate, sodium, whatever, I just, you know, come up with something. Don't eat that because if you don't recognize it, your gut won't. And that will just, it's been shown to disrupt your microbiome and lead to inflammation. So that is really important for food health, for gut health. Right. And especially because at least in the United States, there's not that much regulation on what these mm. companies are putting in the foods because they go, they have a, a thing called generally recognized as safe. And basically is if nobody has had any, proven deleterious health results from eating it, then they just keep it on the shelf. And, and if it comes up that somebody gets an unhealthy result from it, then they may take it out of the processed food, but then they'll replace it with something else that's very similar to it, but it has a different name. And so it goes all over again. And then in Europe, they have a precautionary principle. So they don't always allow as many things as they do in the very same brands as they have in the U.S., which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point, actually, that because it's not regulated, we can't just trust it just because it's out there. So, right. yeah. so guys, cigarettes are on the shelf. You can still mm -hmm. buy cigarettes. So think about it. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not even keeping up with the rest of the country or the rest of the world. So that's very that's a great point. Uh, my next one is avoid excess sugar. 
sugar is going to disrupt the microbiome and it's going to lead to inflammation both in the gut and systemically and even on a plant-based diet so people are still having a little bit of maple syrup or or maybe a little honey if they're not completely vegan uh they might add a little sugar and i see this sometimes in people they're doing a little brown sugar and and it, a little bit is not going to disrupt the whole microbiome but too much will and one thing that it does is your gut, you feed your gut, right? And your gut speaks to you. So if you start eating sugar, you're going to feed those certain microbiome that thrive on sugar. And they're going to tell you, I need more sugar. So if you're facing food addictions or cravings for sweets, stop eating sugar cold because you're feeding those microbiome and they're constantly telling you, I want more sugar, I want more sugar, eat, eat, eat. And you're like, no, I don't want to. And, and, but then you finally give in, have a little bit of something, boom, you're going to keep feeding them. So it's really important to get sugar completely out of your diet. And I'm an all or nothing. I don't believe we should, I think a lot of people should not even have a little because a little leads to more and leads to these bacteria overgrowth. It can lead to things like yeast infections and just a misbalanced dysbiosis, misbalance um, of the microbiome of the whole body and inflammation. And so it really, it should go. If you can have just that little bit, <clears throat> a teaspoon for the whole day or two, one or two for the whole day, it's okay if it if you don't go crazy. And that's a small percentage of people can do that. But for a lot of us, we can't, and it, it actually is more disrupting. So really be careful about taking in excess sugar. Um, the next one is another toxin that I think people know, and that's alcohol. And the reason is, you know, we know with COVID, what were we doing? We were using alcohol hand, um, you know, creams and, and alcohol wipes everywhere and alcohol kills viruses and bacteria. <clears throat> so if you're eat, drinking alcohol, you're disrupting your microbiome and you can lead to, um, microbiome imbalance and then leaky gut and loss of integrity. So alcohol is a big one. You know, an occasional glass of alcohol is probably not going to do that to people, um, especially some of the already healthy gut, <clears throat> but regular alcohol use or excess certainly is a problem. Um, the next one, we already talked about the next two, so I'll just say them fast. Avoid antibiotics and NSAIDs. So we, we know that they're damaging. So both of those are going to damage. And even though I say avoid antibiotics, sometimes you need them. They're life-saving. So if you have a bacterial infection, they are life-saving. And we can help you fix the microbiome afterwards. So, so don't worry too much if you have to use them. But try not to take them unless you need to. Like if you have an upper respiratory infection, try not to take them unless it's a diagnosed known uh, bacterial infection. Can you just specify for those that aren't familiar, because they may be taking NSAIDs, but not knowing that they're... That oh, they what are. they are. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. So things like ibuprofen, Aleve, um, those are two examples that come to mind. There's a ton of them out there. Um, Meloxicam, I think, is another one that people take for joint pains. There's a lot of them out there. And so, and I'm happy to talk to people about that more later on, but... What, the way I see it is they're anti-inflammatories. And um, if you are having inflammation, then we should be looking at the root cause. Where is this inflammation coming from, right? It's usually coming from the gut. So when I see people, if they're on these medications, I work hard to improve their gut, to calm down their inflammation, and then they don't need those medicines anymore. And there's other anti-inflammatories, which are more natural, like turmeric, which is safe and has good side effects, not negative, with an anti-inflammatory diet, an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, and then they don't need those anymore. So yeah, those are, and another one is prednisone that also disrupts. And if you're on it, please don't stop cold turkey. That is a really bad idea. I've been on it for years. You have to taper down slowly and you can when we work on a gut health program and get your gut healthier, then over time, hopefully you need less prednisone. That's how I did it myself, but you can't stop that one, um, cold turkey. So. And the last two are pretty easy. Um, so the next one is eat fermented foods. So eating um, foods like um, fermented cabbage, so your kimchi or sauerkraut or any fermented beans. People are fermenting all sorts of cool stuff right now on the internet. And you can see that. Be careful with excess salt. So I recommend making your own and try not to use excess salt as that too, salt can actually um, irritate the gut lining if you do too much salt. 
but uh, fermented food brings more bacteria in. So it helps diversify. So adding fermented foods. Um, but you wouldn't need to eat a lot of fermented foods, right? Especially because, especially right. if you're watching your sodium, you could have a small. Very small. And you don't need it if you're in balance. If you're healthy, you don't need it. Because if you eat all this fiber, diversity of fiber, your body will make your own. But if you're out of balance or you're trying to diversify it a little bit, just a little bit. And right, you don't need a lot. Um, because especially with the salt, mm -hmm. that's one thing that kind of ruins fermented food. So you have yeah. to wait ahead. Not you can make it with low salt. I think Dr. Furman has a low salt um, fermented food recipe that people can look at. And the last one is not. This one sounds counterintuitive, but it's not eating late at night. <clears throat> and there's more evidence these days. <clears throat> excuse me. There's more evidence these days about the importance of intermittent fasting, right? And this is a big one for gut health. And, oh, actually I have one more that I want to talk about. This is a big one for gut health because when we don't eat at night, our gut repairs itself. So when we're eating, if we eat all day long or three meals a day, it's hard on the gut, right? We talked about the process. You have to chew it really well. The stomach has to digest it for us. All that acid is in there. It goes into the small intestine and now it has all of the digestive enzymes, you know, still breaking it up more. And now it's moving through our guts. Peristalsis is happening and it's absorbing nutrients and get rid of toxins and it's excreting. That's a lot of work on our bodies, right? And it's only one cell layer thick and it's been shown it gets damaged every time we eat that one cell that layer thick gets damaged. But our bodies are miraculous. They can heal themselves and they heal when we're not eating. So at nighttime, when we're not eating, the body can start to repair it. It repairs that single layer. It The microbiome gets back in balance. So uh, that, that period of time when we're not eating is crucial. So I recommend eating your dinner, trying to finish by seven. Everyone's different. Sometimes you can't, I get it, I get it. Figure out what works for your life. I too have, am making adjustments to try to get earlier, but make adjustments if you can over time, figure out what works for your family to try to stop eating by seven or whatever time you can, even earlier is better, but seven's a good place to start. And then not eating till the next morning, at least seven, if not eight, that period of not eating will start, will get a lot of repair in. And that alone has helped people with irritable bowel syndrome, people with GERD, heartburn, people with um, irregular stools, uh, constipation or, or loose stools, it's helped just by not eating at night. So it's huge to repairing the gut and having and optimizing gut health. And along that way, because now we're talking about fun lifestyle factors. I love including the lifestyle factors yes. because they're so crucial to be a healthy body. It's, you know, we're, we're holistic. We have to look at everything together and all plays a role. And the last one we kind of talked about, because you had a great question for us, but it's about sleep. When we go to sleep, so around eight o'clock at night, it's getting dark, right? Hopefully we don't have bright lights on and it's get, starting to get dark. As it gets dark, gets dark, our melatonin goes up to help us sleep through the night. Melatonin is known as the master hormone. It kind of helps all sorts of things. It helps prevent cancer like breast cancer. It helps regulate, it's our circadian rhythm. It helps regulate sleep and wake time. But it, it also has an important role in that it helps heal the gut. So it repairs the gut lining. Remember that one cell layer thick? Melatonin helps repair it. So when we get a good night of sleep, when we allow it to get dark at night before we go to bed and we go to bed, let's say at 10 or 11 PM, our melatonin you know, is in full gear and it's helping repair our guts. So a good night of sleep is essential to healing your gut along with not eating at that time. And in the morning we wake up with healthier guts just by going to sleep and getting a good night of sleep and not eating. So it's amazing the importance of sleep. We talked about stress reduction for that vagus nerve and managing that chewing our food well and um, not eating at night and eating good, clean, whole food, plant-based, fiber-rich foods and cutting out all this bad stuff. That's kind of a summary to optimize good gut health. And if people start doing that, I swear I'd see 50%, if not more, if not less gut issues every day. Wow, there were so many great tips and none of them included any prescriptions or any procedures and it, th that was just wonderful. And if people could, I think that they just have to give themselves a chance. And I like the fact that you're a lifestyle medicine doc, because typically when people are coming to doctors with these issues, 
they're prescribing medications or they want to run tests, which tests are good, but many times the tests lead to procedures and you are looking at the, the whole picture and we still, we just want to know, give me this one magic pill or this one superfood and it's going to cure everything. But it's, it's much more complicated than that. And I hope that people are getting a lot about that information from this uh, presentation that you're doing today, because there is a lot and you, and you consider a lot when you, you do the plant-based telehealth. So if somebody came to you and they had one of these conditions, you, you would, go about and get a, gather a lot of information. Is that right? That is right. And so the way we do it is people get a full uh, intake form. So they fill it out. So before they even come in, I already know a lot of this about them. And they may, let's say they're coming in to see me for cardiovascular issues or high cholesterol, high blood pressure, or weight loss, things like that. If I see them, I'm, I'm going to look right away at everything about them. How stressful is their life? How much sleep are they getting? Right. So I get a picture of all this. I want to know what they're eating and are they eating enough fiber or anything that's contributing to worsening? And so I will be dealing with all of this. And so we'll deal with the blood pressure. You know, they may be on medications and we may make some adjustments in that right at the beginning. And I help them, you know, as they make these changes, we can start getting them off medication. So I work with them to do that safely because we can't just stop stuff cold turkey and we have to be careful to regulate that. And yeah, so we're looking at everything and how it all interplays and um, work, work on a, a diet and lifestyle plan that works for that person, for each person. So it is individualized and we it is comprehensive where we look at everything about that person so that we have an idea. And then it's by putting it this all together, dealing with all of these issues that people be, can begin their self-healing process. And then we can hopefully taper off medications. And it's a beautiful thing because it really works. Like I had a patient the other day who came to see me with rheumatoid arthritis, pretty severe joint pains, and she had wet and messed up gut. She didn't come to me for the gut, but I found it in talking to her and we worked hard on improving her gut health. So we had her chew food or blend it or cook it. Do We did different tricks to get her gut health healthier. And over time, you know, we had to include a couple supplements and we switched a few things around. And over time, her gut, she's like, oh my gosh, I'm having normal poops, which she hadn't had in a long time. And she was so excited about that. And I was so excited about that. We were high-fiving from a distance and uh, it kept improving. Improving. And over time, her joint pains got better and better. She, when I first saw her, she couldn't close her hands because she had so much pain. And when we were done, she was able to make a full fist. Oh, so, <laughs> and we did that by improving her gut health. Like that's how yeah. I improved her joint health. I didn't do anything magical to her hands. I mean, we worked at some finger exercise. We did do a few little things, but it was gut health. And so it's remarkable how it works when you improve the gut. And and um, she's eating slowly now and, you know, we're doing, she's doing all these little tricks. So it really works. Yeah. Cause sometimes, sometimes people adopt the plant-based lifestyle and then they don't get the results that they were hoping for. And they think that it just doesn't work for them, but you can definitely help them tweak it. It looks like that we have some questions coming up. So we, oh, you were talking about smoothies and you kind of addressed it um, after this person typed in the question, but I just still want to talk about it a little bit more. So Sharon wanted to say, so smoothies are not good. So you kind of talked about it a little bit. If you would explain what makes a good smoothie, if, if you think they're good. Yeah. Thank you for that question. That's a really good question. They can be good, but they can be bad too. So it depends on how they're made. If you make them with greens, so it's predominantly greens. If this is your blender, and you pack in the greens, right? You put in you put in scoops of greens and you really pack them in there. So it's a green smoothie. So, and then you just put in a small amount of fruit, like 20, 25% of it is fruit. And that can be fruit of choice, frozen fruit, frozen berries, um, frozen raspberries and strawberries seem to take away the bitterness I found, but you can use any fruit. Some people use bananas. So a small amount of fruit, a little bit of those flax and chia seeds um, adds a little bit of fat and omega threes to your smoothie, and if you and then water. If you drink a smoothie like that, it's been shown to lower your CRP or inflammatory C-reactive protein. It gives you those greens that I'm talking about that really help your your heal your microbiome and healing power of the greens, and it does not spike your blood sugar level. So it won't spike your blood insulin level. It does not lead to weight gain and it's hydrating. It's good for skin. It's really good. All It fills you with carotenoids and all this good stuff. So a green smoothie like that is excellent. But if you make a fruit smoothie, 
So if you put in a bunch of fruit, maybe one handful of spinach and it's all fruit, or you start throwing in peanut butter or other things, it's high in calories. It can spike your blood sugar and that leads to inflammation. So you never want to do that. And it doesn't give you all the nutrition. So if you make a, a green smoothie, it's awesome. If you make a fruit smoothie or other smoothie, then it may actually be harmful. Well, that's good advice. I, I agree. I like to have a green smoothie every morning and it's it's got a wow. Well, a lot of things inside of it. And then that's how you tell. You tell by the, the color of it. <laughs> yeah, right. If it's like that <laughs> purple color or green color. Like if you put blueberries in, it gets a purple mud color. Yeah. But, you know, right. it's, it's it's delicious. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And some people are, are embarrassed to take them around with them. So they'll, they'll um, like what I have here, I, get, I, I have this because it's insulated, but that's what I tell people. If you're embarrassed that people would see you drinking something green, you can put it in a stainless steel cup like this. It's insulated and people won't know what you really drink. Yeah, that's you true. You don't want to draw attention to yourself. Yeah, or you could put a touch of mango or banana in there and it's this beautiful bright green color. And then I want to show it off. Like yeah, that's true. Look, this beautiful <laughs> green is going to be in me, do, healing my body, doing all good stuff like I... I love to look at it when it's beautiful like that. Okay, broccoli. I want that name. Broccoli wants to know, is it safe to eat one pound of cabbage every day? Uh, that's a good question. People are doing it and seem to be doing okay. But in general, the answer is going to be no. That's going to be too much, especially if it's all raw. Here's why. So broccoli or uh, cabbage, well, all those cruciferous vegetables, the cabbage family, they have goitogens that if your iodine level is low and you eat too much of them, that they interfere with thyroid health. And we, I have seen patients presenting hypothyroid because they're eating so much raw um, cabbage or other cruciferous vegetable. And so we've cut them down to, I recommend no more really than about four to six six cups a day, which is a little more than half a pound to three quarters of a pound raw. And, and even with that amount, you want to make sure your iodine level is okay, that you have a good iodine source, that it's not too high or too low. We check iodine levels to make sure, because if your iodine is out of balance, uh, either too high or too low, then eating all of these cruciferous vegetables actually can cause thyroid issues. And it is a problem. So you want to make sure iodine is okay. And then you can you can eat, or if you have a pound occasionally, it's okay. But this person was eating a pound and a half to two pounds every day, and she presented with hypothyroidism. And so I was able to look at her food, and we cut, it, we cut that down, and it improved. Um, and if you cook them, you deactivate some of those goitrogens, and so you can eat more cooked. So for the raw, I would keep it to half a pound a day-ish, maybe a little bit more. And occasionally you can do a pound. It's okay if you do it here and there for, or for a little week or something. It most likely is okay if your iodine is okay. But if you do it chronically for a long time, you could get yourself in trouble if you're not watching it. Well, that's good to know because I think a lot of people that are doing plant-based, they probably are aware of the sea vegetables and how you have to be careful not to have too much of that because you could have too much iodine. But I didn't know. I'm not sure if everybody was aware of that. So that's a good tip. Okay. Uh, okay. So we were talking about the, the sugar. So Sharon wants to know, is date paste okay to use or not? Good question. Um, I think it is. And I say I think because I don't have data to support it, but I have patients eating date paste and it's not causing inflammation in that because dates are made with fiber and and they have so much magnesium, potassium, all these wonderful nutrients and all this fiber. And even though you're blending it now with water, that's how you make date paste, typically water and, and dates. So you've blended it, but still does have fiber in it. So it's better than the sugar, which is just isolated sugar bolus to your your blood without without the fiber and it's processed sugar is but this is not processed i mean more than just blended and it still does have fiber even though you've broken the fiber so yes if you add it if you're making a dessert or you add a little date paste it is okay if you go too crazy with it though you will start to see inflammation with high amounts of things like that even dried fruit if you eat dates you eat a whole container of dates which I'm not going to say anyone's ever done it before, but it is possible that people could eat a whole thing of dates. Um, if you eat something like that, that can cause inflammation. So if you were to do a ton of date paste, you know, put it on everything and overdo it, there's a point. But in general, it's great. It's fine. You can sweeten your oatmeal or your dessert or whatever with date paste. 
Okay, that's my sweetener of choice is dates and date paste. So. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes. So Anne says, I have too much acid in my stomach. If I take an antacid with food, I don't get cramps or have to rush to the bathroom. How can I reduce the acid naturally? Good question. So if I were seeing you, Anne, I would have all these questions for you. And so um, things that I would want to know are, What's your diet like? Certain foods pr promote more acid excretion, secretion, I guess. And so foods like protein, if you eat animal protein or high protein foods, it causes more acid to be released to digest them. So that's one thing. What time of day you're eating, you actually produce more acid later in the day than earlier in the day. So eating later in the evening or night, eating a heavy meal at night, produces more acid and leads can lead to GERD and heartburn and acid issues. So eating either not eating at night or eating a very small light thing like a salad and then eating the bulk of your food earlier is helpful. Not overeating. So eating too much at once secretes the acid and then it kind of leaks out of the stomach like up the esophagus. So it causes more acid to be released. Um, adding fiber and adding um, low glycemic fruits and vegetables and those greens, like I talked about, will help some of the acid production as well. Uh, so those are some of my initial thoughts. You can also have things like vinegar with your meal or right before, like apple cider vinegar is known to help with some of the acid. Um, so if you're having real hard acid loads, you could do apple cider vinegar or also baking soda in very small amounts. Baking soda is very alkalizing and can be helpful. Those are some natural things that I would do, but there's a lot of diet and lifestyle that I didn't talk about right now that we could also evaluate to see if we can figure out why that is. So, um, and there are some anatomical things. People with hiatal hernias will get acid reflux and it's hard to repair that without repairing the hiatal hernia. So sometimes there's anatomical, but in general, there's a lot we can do through diet. And like so. Wow, you just got a consult there. <laughs> and and more detail to come if you if you make an appointment. I think that it would be worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So uh Jamie said, I went uh whole food plant based three months ago and I still have so much gas. What can I do? Great question. First of all, good job going plant based. Uh, yeah, so it can happen right at the beginning because of the increased fiber. Your microbiome is not used to all this fiber. So uh, a couple things. One, chew your food really well. Not chewing your food well or eating too fast leads to gas, increased gas and bloating. So that's number one. Make sure you blend it, chew it, cook it. Things like that will help pre pre-digest it for you. So make sure you're doing all of those things that we talked about. And Two, sometimes it's hard. If you jumped all in both feet right away, it's it's it can be too much on the microbiome. And so sometimes we slow it back down instead of eating a cup of beans a day. Maybe you're not ready for that. I sometimes will start with just a tablespoon with your meal and eat it, chew it well, let your body digest. You'll get a little gas, but hopefully not so much gas. And then you don't eat again till your dinner. And then you have another tablespoon of beans instead of eating it's just too much at once. So you you kind of train your microbiome, like you got to gradually increase the amount of fiber load. So that's one thing that can work. And then if your gut is out of balance, so if you have dysbiosis, you're going to, you may keep getting gas and bloating, and then you're going to want to do some of these tricks. So you may need to eat lower fiber fruits and vegetables. Initially, you may need to cook them or blend them. Um, we have, I have a whole protocol for people who have persisted gas and bloating, even after making some of the initial dietary changes, if it persists or they have certain symptoms, then there's a whole protocol of what to eat to help get rid of that, to get that back in balance. And so it includes things like blending it, cooking it, certain lower fiber fruits and vegetables and foods, um, and then gradually adding back in, not gradually, but in a stepwise fashion, adding back in. So you want to be on a diverse whole food plant based diet. That's what we're going for. But it might it just takes training of the microbiome in a little more time. So if you do some of these initial changes and you're still having issues, you can work with someone who can help you get that back in balance. 
Yeah, it's kind of it sounds like it, when you go to the gym and you have a personal trainer telling you what to do with this muscle and and no, you're not doing it this way. You should do it that way, and it'll it'll be better results. And so you sound like a personal trainer for your butt. <laughs> it's true. It's true. If you jump in, it's like starting going to the gym for the first time, picking up a fifty pound weight. Well, you couldn't do that. You got to start with ten pounds or five pounds, and grad as you get stronger, then you increase it. And that's with our gut. If you have bacteria that are used to eating processed food and meat and dairy and you know standard american diet all of a sudden you flood it with all this fiber you don't have those microbiome there ready to digest it yet and so it, it just takes a little more time and we got to get it in balance so it can digest it appropriately well it sounds like you you have a lot of different patients that have different issues with the gut and other others as well and you've heard the different stories and somebody could make an appointment with you at plantbasedtelehealth.com and not be be embarrassed if they maybe ate something they shouldn't have or didn't do it exactly right. It, you, you seem like very, very easy to talk to and, and you can come up with some solutions for them. Yeah, I mean, I'm human too. We're all human. We've all eaten things. I was on a standard American diet and I have fallen off, you know, here and there with eating sweets or processed foods. And I've seen the results in myself and in my patients. That's why I'm sharing it. But I get it. And, and we do live different lives. Some people are traveling or they go, you know, they just have different lives for me. And so we got to find what works for each person, what, what can actually fit into their lifestyle, what changes they can make and what we can make work. So that's, that's the goal of seeing every single person. Right. And so you want to talk a little bit about what they, that somebody could have a a nice telemedicine conference with you. And it would kind of look like what you see on the screen now, as if I was having a consult with you, it would look like that if they were having it. So tell, tell us about it. They can go to plantbasedtelehealth.com. We'll put a link in the show notes too. Yeah, thanks, Amy. So it's it looks just like this, you're right. And so you'll see me on Zoom, just like you see me with the same background. This is my little office here. And um, so, what happens is you go to this website and you set up a portal for yourself. And then after you have a portal, you can go to the calendar and select me, let's say, if you want to make an appointment. So you make an appointment with me on the portal. And then I will send you immediately a whole bunch of intake forms. So like I said, the intake form is five pages. We ask you so many questions because I'm going to look at all of that. and It's going to help me with the holistic view. And you can select an appointment for 30 minutes or an hour. And if you think about it, 30 minutes is not very long for you to tell me everything that's been going on and for me to give you, you know, a plan to work on a plan with you to how to correct some of these things. And so it's not very long, but the way we make it work is because I look at the paperwork ahead a time you fill it out and I look at it. So I already, we already have the background so we can kind of jump into the good stuff. Um, if it's complicated, you can have an hour, you can set up for an hour appointment, which has been great for some people who have a lot going on, or you can upload your labs and your previous um, past medical history, anything that you want to share. And then we have our appointments and it's 30 minutes. It's just like this. And then when it's done, I type up a note and I share it with you at the end of the day. And it's everything we talked about with the plan and handouts. And I can order labs at a local lab and I can do um, prescriptions for you at, at a local pharmacy. And I am, I am licensed in 24 states now. So um, if you're in one of my states, you can make an appointment with me if you're interested, or you could see one of our other doctors. We cover all 50 states and international. So it's very exciting. Yeah, that's great. And what I like about it is because there are some great plant-based doctors out there, but they're concierge and you have to pay a membership every month. You have to pay whether you see them or not. They're, they're available to you, but maybe you didn't use them that month. And maybe somebody just has a couple of things they need to tweak and they just want to make that one-time appointment. And then maybe mm -hmm. after that, they want to come back in three months. So it's, it's, I think it's a more affordable way to, to go about it. So I think that's great. Well, thank you so much for coming back. And you guys, I'm going to put mm -hmm. the links to the different interviews that I've had with Dr. Miller, because she has so many great things that she's talked to us about as far as your health and how it relates to plant-based health. And I wanted to ask you guys if you could type in the comments, what was your takeaway for today? What did you learn about this lifestyle? And what did you learn about from Dr. Miller today? And or what are you hoping to do about it? That would be great. And then help people who are looking at this video and thinking about whether or not they wanted to, to take a peek. So please stay tuned for a special announcement. I did want to thank Jess Tass from Just Has Voice also because she did the the countdown and the promos. 
And Dr. Miller, you were just fabulous. I hope you'll come back again. I really do. Mm -hmm. It's so nice to have you again because there's so many more things that you could talk about. So just test voice, who's coming up next? Learn how a plant-based lifestyle can help alleviate fibromyalgia symptoms with Dr. Kim Scheuer, MD, on Friday, February 18th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, on Be Green with Amy Live. But most of all, I want to thank all of you. You've been watching, you've been commenting and sharing and talking to each other in the chat, which is really nice because we're building a really nice community here. And I'm hoping that you got a lot out of this. And if you can give us a like or a share, that'll help us to get this information out to more people in the world. And you can help me with Dr. Miller. You can type in my tagline, which is be strong, be well, and be green. You can type that in the comments and we're going to sign off and say that. Are you ready, Dr. Miller? I'm ready. Okay, well, until I see you guys again, remember, be strong, be well, and be green. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Now you can listen to Be Green with Amy expert interviews wherever you go. Listen while walking, meal prepping, or traveling. Find Be Green with Amy on Apple, Google, Alexa, Amazon, or virtually anywhere you find podcasts. Be strong, be well, and be green with Be Green with Amy.